Hello, my name is Rochelle Domley. I am the Trauma Medical Director and General uh, ACS Surgeon up at Mercy in Coon Rapids. And today I'm going to be giving you the lecture on abdominal and pelvic trauma. So this is meant to be an interactive discussion. However, since this is going to be recorded, I'll try to point out the take home points that each slide and sort of the general lecture is supposed to be going over and try to point out some things that perhaps may have come up if this was indeed an interactive discussion. So as with all the other lectures that you have, uh, the aim of this discussion is to apply the ATLS knowledge and use it from what you've read in the student manual and apply it to the actual patient in front of you. Most of the other things that are specifically required for this lecture are meant to be uh, in the interactive environment, so we'll go ahead and skip over that. So overall, what we want to talk about here for abdominal and pelvic trauma is that uncontrolled or unrecognized blood loss from abdominal and pelvic injuries can result in preventable death. So the, we're going to go through a case scenario and that's going to point out some of the uh, pearls when it comes to abdominal and pelvic trauma. So at the end of this discussion, we will identify the anatomic regions of the abdomen that are critical in assessing and managing trauma patients, discuss the risk for abdominal and pelvic injuries based on mechanism, identify patients who require surgical consultation and possible surgical or catheter-based intervention, determine appropriate diagnostic procedures to ascertain if a patient has ongoing hemorrhage or other injuries that can cause delayed morbidity and or mortality, formulate an acute management plan for abdominal and pelvic injuries utilizing this case scenario, and discuss the importance of early identification and emergent management of pelvic hemorrhage. So our patient is a 28-year-old male who's a helmeted motorcyclist involved in a high-speed collision head-on into the side of a vehicle that pulled out in front of him. The patient was able to report a brief loss of consciousness and is complaining of pain in his chest, abdomen, and pelvis. His blood pressure is 100 over 75, heart rate of 115, respiratory rate of 20, and his GCS is 15. He's on a backboard and has a C collar in place. So what are your priorities in managing this patient? So as is the mantra in ATLS, the primary survey is the first thing that we're going to be uh, doing when we get this patient into the trauma bay. So just Going through this, the management priorities are rapidly assessing airway, breathing, and circulation. So the patient is awake and alert and interactive. We can say that the airway is intact. Breathing, you know, he's gonna be hooked up to monitors. You're gonna see how fast he's breathing, listen for breath sounds, and presumably they are equal and bilateral. And you're going to be placing oxygen on the patient as well as hooking him up, hooking him up to uh, assess his uh, oxygen saturation. And he'll be connected to continuous e e ECG monitoring. So looking at his vital signs, what are you worried about? His blood pressure is could be normal for a 28-year-old, otherwise healthy male, uh, but his heart rate is elevated. And presumably this is a sinus tachycardia. Given his age, we're not uh, particularly worried about this being atrial fibrillation or another um, tachy arrhythmia. So that heart rate of 115 can clue you into the, the fact that there could be some hemorrhage and he could potentially go on to hemorrhagic shock. So this could be from either his chest, abdomen, or pelvis. Since we're focusing on abdominal and pelvic trauma, we're gonna focus on the sources in the abdomen and pelvis. 
Tachycardia could also be just from fear or from pain. So you want to assess for other etiologies as well. Uh, but other things that go along with the concern for hemorrhage would be assessing his extremities for coolness, modeling, uh, his skin color for pallor, and also look for any change in mentation throughout the time that he is with you and you're assessing him that could indicate poor cerebral perfusion or a head injury. So what's your initial therapy for this patient? Okay, so first thing is that we need to obtain reliable IV access. Okay, as far as interventions go, we put on non-invasive things like the monitors and we've done our uh, ABCs, but we need to achieve IV access. So either intravenous or intraosseous access. What other things? Labs. So the first and most important lab, and if you can only get one lab from your patient, that should be a type and cross match. So that should be the first tube that's drawn in, in the trauma bay, and if that's all the blood that you can get, that's what you need, and that's what's most important in potentially saving this patient's life. You'll start uh, volume resuscitation, so one liter of crystalloid, and from then on, move on to blood products. And if there's concern for a pelvic fracture, you may need to initiate a pelvic binder. And so that's, we've sort of established that A and B are intact and we've moved on to C. If there's concern for bleeding that's not yet controlled, we're gonna make sure we have access to give blood products and fluid and also one non-invasive way to stop bleeding at this point is to place a pelvic binder. So EMS has reported to you that the patient was found 10 feet from his motorcycle. He was lying on his right side, wearing a helmet, and the speed was approximately 45 miles per hour. The patient reported that he landed hard on his right side, that he had a brief loss of consciousness. He reports no allergies, no previous medical history, and no current medications. So based on the reported mechanism of injury, what intra-abdominal and or pelvic injury is the patient likely to have sustained? So taking all of this into account, what injuries are you worried about? Well, based on the mechanism, so he was uh, in a high-speed collision, he was on a motorcycle, he landed hard on his right side, we're worried about the risk of intra-abdominal uh, solid organ injury, like the liver and the spleen, bowel injury, either uh, the bowel itself, the mesentery of the bowel or the vascular supply to the bowel, as well as the retroperitoneal viscera, the retroperitoneal vascular structures, those, those are all including the kidney as well as the adrenals and pelvic fractures. Now, the ribs are overlying the area where some of these organs are, so overlying uh, rib fractures are also possible. But like I said, in this one, we're really focusing on the abdominal and pelvic sources. Thinking about this, how would the risk of intra-abdominal injury change if the patient described striking the handlebar into the epigastrium? So whenever we think about this quote-unquote handlebar injuries, uh, that basically compresses the solid organs and the hollow organs up against the spine. And in the epigastrium, we're talking about the pancreas, the duodenum and the small bowel. So we would have a higher index of suspicion of a pancreatic laceration, transection, uh, duodenal perforation or possibly transection, as well as a small bowel injury. How would the risk of intra-abdominal injury change if, 
a penetrating injury was observed. Well, when talking about penetrating injuries, we need to identify the trajectory of the missile object, um, uh, or uh, if it's a, a sharp object, like a knife laceration, um, that will help us identify what organs are at risk for injury. If it's a gunshot wound, the actual site of entry may be remote from the abdomen and the pelvis, but yet may still cause injury to structures within that cavity. Uh, so you have to have a high index of suspicion. So as this as we continue to examine this patient, he's complaining of right-sided lower chest tenderness. He's noted to have contusions on the right side of his chest, his abdomen, and his right flank. His right upper quadrant is tender. His right flank and suprapubic regions are also tender. He has pain on palpation of his anterior pelvis. There is no blood noted at the urethromiatus. Rectal examination is normal. And he, after receiving 500 mLs of crystalloid, his blood pressure has increased to 110 over 75. Heart rate has reduced to 100. His respiratory rate is 20, and his GCS remains 15. How should you assess the abdomen and pelvis for injury as, and as potential sources of bleeding? Abdominal evaluation is part of assessing circulation. So we've already talked about ensuring um, reliable IV access, initi initiating resuscitation. And further assessing the patient includes obtaining the mechanism of injury history, which we've obtained here and we have it as detailed as possible. A physical examination as we've described here, including the flanks, the perineum, checking the back for wounds, um, checking the pelvis for any signs of pain or tenderness. You need to completely disrobe and roll the patient to be able to see all the areas of the abdomen and pelvis. It is not simply an anterior exam while the patient is supine on the stretcher. Pelvic pain is a sign of a pelvic fracture and you don't necessarily need to do a palpation of the pelvis. If the patient is complaining of pelvic pain, you can assume that they have a pelvic fracture until it's ruled out by plain films. And you can defer that examination as it's likely to just cause more pain for the patient and unlikely to change your, uh, your management of the patient. A rectal exam is also important to evaluate for the concern of a possible urethral injury, uh, and that would be indicated by a high riding prostate or blood on your rectal exam, in addition to blood at the urethral meatus. So other things, based on our knowledge of, of the anatomy, what other uh, injuries aside from abdominal and pelvic injuries are we looking at um, rib fractures? Okay, what about in the abdominal and pelvic cavity? We're probably concerned for potential liver laceration, being that it's on the right side, and the patient hopefully does not have uh, situs inversus. Uh, Right-sided kidney injury, potentially bowel injury, and that could be small bowel or colon, and pelvic fractures. So even if this, the patient was struck on the right side, it, it's, it still hasn't ruled out that any of those initial organs that we talked about within the abdominal and pelvic cavities could be potentially injured. So we still have a high index suspicion for any of those. So is a FAST exam indicated at this stage? So just to recap, as far as where we are in our primary survey, uh, airways intact. Breathing's intact, circulation, his heart rate has improved to 100 after 500 mLs of crystalloid, and he's maintaining his mentation. So I would say that circulation is intact at this point. There's still a concern for possibly ongoing bleeding, uh, but he does not need to be rushed to the operating room at this point. 
So he should undergo a FAST exam. Now, we just wanted to point out that mechanical stability of the pelvis, as I mentioned earlier, is not necessarily required by palpation, and we can defer examination of the pelvis to an orthopedic specialist um, if needed, putting a pelvic binder in place if we determine that there's a source of ongoing bleeding from the pelvis um, until the patient either reaches his final destination or an orthopedic consultant is available at your institution. <clears throat> that, that part of the exam can be deferred to the secondary survey because for, as part of the primary survey, we're just trying to get bleeding under control uh, to control circulation. And if there's concern of bleeding from the pelvis, that would be the um, pelvic binder placement. If this patient were female, what other examination would be relevant? Potentially a vaginal um, examination. That would be indicated for blood or lacerations that may indicate an open pelvic fracture. So say that we've done our fast, patient remains as is without any change in his vital signs. Are there any other radiologic investigations that would be appropriate to arrange for now? Assuming that we are not in a worldwide shortage of IV contrast, uh, depending on your facility and what's available to you, then a CT scan with contrast would be the next stage in investigation for this patient. So we're talking about IV contrast, oral contrast is not necessary, okay? The phases of contrast that would be used for this patient would be the arterial phase and the portal venous phase. Uh, we would also potentially want to get a uh, delayed films uh, that would be indicative of any bladder injury or um, leak from the bladder. Thinking about x-rays in the trauma bay, if the patient's otherwise stable, then you could defer your chest x-ray and pelvis x-ray to CT scans so that you could get your CT, essentially chest, abdomen, pelvis with IV contrast rather than obtaining a pelvic film in the trauma bay. However, at any point, obtaining chest x-ray and pelvis x-rays in the trauma bay are um, always a fine thing to do if there's any concerns about potential bleeding that has not been controlled before the patient leaves the trauma bay if they're not going directly to the operating room. So during your ATLS scenarios and your practicals, what you need to know is what kind of institution you're in. So say that for this, the, the sake of this scenario, your institution has full surgical and radiologic capabilities. You get the CT scan on, on uh, the abdominal cuts. There's a grade three liver laceration, right-sided rib fractures, and bilateral pubic, pubic rami fractures you obtain a surgical consultation, and upon re-review of the patient's vital signs, at this point the blood pressure is normal, heart rate is 100, and you've given a total of one liter of crystalloid. Does this patient need emergent laparotomy? I hope that you've all said no. So the first thing to note is that the patient is at this point, hemodynamically stable. He's not requiring ongoing fluid resuscitation. He's not requiring multiple transfusions of blood products, and his blood pressure is normal. His heart rate is normal. His injuries do not require surgical intervention in the absence of hemodynamic instability. So grade three liver lacerations can be observed and Potentially, you can avoid surgical intervention. Obviously, rib fractures don't necessarily need surgical intervention unless there is a chemothorax that has a certain threshold of 
uh, blood output in a chest tube over a certain time period. And the pubic rami fractures are typically non-operative and uh, are treated with pain control. Obviously, this patient's not going home. He needs to be observed in the hospital. So as he's observed in the hospital, what changes in his clinical status would indicate the need for an operation or other therapies or additional investigations regarding the injuries that we know he has? So any of those findings would give me a high suspicion that there is a bowel injury that would need to be explored in the operating room. Other things would be signs of continued hemorrhage, so tachycardia, hypotension. We would probably be doing serial hemoglobin checks, so drops in the hemoglobin. Now, that could lead to the patient getting either a laparotomy or potentially, potentially uh, angioembolization. So on that initial management of the patient, what would you do differently if the CT scan had showed contrast extravasation suggesting bleeding in the pelvis? It would all be dependent upon if the patient is hemodynamically stable or unstable. So our patient is hemodynamically stable, and so if there is active extravasation suggesting bleeding in the pelvis in this patient, I would favor sending the patient for angioembolization to hopefully avoid a laparotomy. If he is unstable, then you need to bring that patient into the operating room. And uh, you've got one of two options. You're either doing a laparotomy and trying to stay extra peritoneal and perform pre-pelvic packing. Um, or you get into the abdominal cavity and then, potent, then open that uh, peritoneal space and, and pack the pelvis. You are unlikely to get control of bleeding from pelvic fractures without stabilizing the patient with packing and then sending them to uh, IR. Well, at least that's the, the easiest route to go. So in conclusion, this patient did not need an er emergent laparotomy, non-operative management was undertaken. He was admitted to the ICU for monitoring, pain control, and respiratory care, because don't forget he had those rib fractures. So we want to make sure he has good pain control and is taking good deep breaths to prevent a pneumonia. Hemodynamics normalized over 24 hours. He's then transferred to the ward. He's undergoing physical therapy for his pelvic fractures, and he is eventually discharged home on day six. So I hope that after this lecture, you're able to identify the anatomic regions of the abdomen and pelvis that are critical in assessing and managing trauma patients, discuss the risk for injuries based on the mechanism, and which, and which organs and uh, structures are likely to be injured depending on what, what the mechanism is. Identify patients who require surgical consultation and possible surgical or catheter-based intervention. Determine appropriate diagnostic procedures to ascertain if a patient has ongoing hemorrhage and or other injuries that can cause delayed morbidity and mortality. Formulate an acute management plan for abdominal and pelvic injuries utilizing a case scenario, and discuss the importance of early identification and emergent management of pelvic hemorrhage. The key learning points from this lecture was that mechanism of injury is critical when you're considering injuries to the abdomen and pelvis. A thorough examination of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis includes evaluating all sides, the anterior, lateral, posterior, and perineum to avoid missing significant injuries. Appropriate diagnostic procedures should be employed. And we talked about obtaining a fast exam and CT scans with IV contrast and potentially delayed films, which would uh, indicate potential for a bladder injury. 
Surgical intervention is assessed via clinical findings and the patient's response to management and early identification and emergent management of pelvic hemorrhage can be life-saving. Thank you.